Hello, seventh graders. I hope you are doing well during this kind of crazy time. Um, I miss you guys. I wish we could have class and meet on Wednesdays like usual, but right now that is not possible. So I'm going to try to make a few of these um, over the summer, especially because you guys are done with school now. So you might have a little bit of time to watch some videos about the faith. Um, and I'm just going to quickly cover some things that we didn't get to um, during our time together during the school year. We are not sure yet when, as of when I'm making this video, we're not sure yet when churches will open again, um, when we're going to be able to gather in large groups again. So right now, just enjoy the time at home as best you can, uh, be loving towards your families as best you can, and pray for everybody who's suffering right now, pray for healthcare workers. Um, yeah. Okay, so... What I want to talk about in this video is one of the topics we did not get to. It was a very next lesson that we would have had. Um, it was about Mary. So Mary is the mother of God, right? We've probably heard that before. And I've talked before in class, if you remember, that everything we believe about Mary says something also about what we believe about Jesus. So everything we believe about Mary safeguards what we believe about Jesus. So we call Mary the mother of God. Why do we call her the mother of God? Well, this reaffirms that we believe Jesus is God, right? So he is fully God, fully man from the moment of his conception. So that means Mary is the mother of Jesus, so she's the mother of God. Now, God existed before Mary did. God created Mary, but because she's the mother of Jesus, she also has the title of the mother of God, okay? So... At the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her that she was going to be the mother of the Savior, the angel said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So this language of the power of the Most High overshadowing her, this is very important because in the Old Testament, there was the Ark of the Covenant. We talked just a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant way back at the beginning of class when I had that chart on the board with all the figures of the Old Testament leading up to Jesus. And the Ark of the Covenant had God's presence with it, right? And the Israelite people carried around the Ark of the Covenant wherever they went. And there was a shadow, this glory cloud over the Ark of the Covenant. And so then Mary, who carries the presence of God within her womb, she is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So he's not naturally conceived as normally babies are. Um, Mary is also addressed at the Annunciation as full of grace. The angel Gabriel says, hail full of grace, the Lord is with you. We kind of recognize those words, right? These are the words of the Hail Mary. When we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And what does it mean when we echo those words? So Mary is full of grace. We've learned that grace is God's life and God's love, right? She's filled with the presence of God. And what kills the life of grace in us is sin, right? But Mary is sinless. She never sinned throughout her whole life and by a singular, by a special grace of God, she was also conceived without original sin. That means that that original sin we've learned about that's been passed down from Adam and Eve, our first parents, through all of humanity, right? That we're all born with original sin and then baptism takes that away. Well, Mary was actually conceived without original sin. So she is filled with grace. She's filled with the presence of God, and this makes her the perfect mother for Jesus, right? The perfect mother for God. So we call that the Immaculate Conception, that she was totally sinless her whole life and was preserved even from the stain of original sin. And this is all just God's gift and part of God's plan for salvation, and he invites her to cooperate in that plan for salvation, right? So... We talked about how one Old Testament thing, the Ark of the Covenant, is kind of, it's fulfilled in Mary. There's another um, figure that she's kind of the new version of, um, and that is, we call Mary the new Eve. So Eve was in Genesis, right? Adam and Eve, the first two people. And Eve was the one who, Eve and Adam, they committed the first sin, right? 
so Eve doubted God. She didn't trust God. She didn't trust that God had her best, her what was best for her in mind, right? So Eve doubted, but Mary totally trusted. When she heard the plan of God, she said yes to that, right? She said, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. So Eve doubted, but Mary trusted. And Eve was disobedient, but Mary was obedient to God. And whereas Eve was the mother of all the living, Mary now becomes the mother of all those who are born to new life in Christ. So she is our mother as well. We call her the mother of the church. So who is the church? It is all of us, right? We are part of the church. We are part of the body of Christ. And this church that Jesus gave us, this church that he entrusted to his, the apostles, that he said the gates of hell will not prevail against, Mary is the mother of this church, and she's also the perfect model of this church. So she's a perfect model of faith because she had total trust in God. Her doubt, she never doubted. Her faith never wavered, right, throughout her whole life. She's also a perfect model of hope that the plan of God will be fulfilled, that God will keep his promises to his people. So Mary would have grown up Jewish, right? And the Jewish people prayed the Psalms, and these Psalms talk of the hope for a Savior. She would have known the story of the Jewish people, that they were longing for a Savior, and she kept this hope alive in her. So she's a perfect model of hope, and just as we hope for our own salvation, we hope that we will see God face to face someday. Um, she's a model of that hope, right? She's also a model of perfect trust and perfect surrender to the will of God. So she totally conformed her life to God's plan, totally gave herself over to the plan of God. And we want to do the same in our lives, right? We want every moment to be able to say yes to God's plan in the big ways and in the little ways. So when our parents ask us to do something that we don't necessarily want to do, we can step back and say, okay, wait a second. God gave me my parents. And I'm supposed to honor them. I'm supposed to love them. So I'm going to try to, even though I don't want to clean my room right now, I'm going to try to love my parents in that. And then I know I'm loving God in that too. So this total trust and total surrender to the will of God and to God's command, she is a perfect model of this, even in suffering. So even when times got hard, when she had to flee to Egypt with her newborn son, even when Jesus died on the cross, Mary still stayed by his side and she still trusted God. She stayed there with him in that. So she is a perfect model for us of how to give our suffering over to the Lord and still trust the Lord in those hard moments and to keep going to God, to not run away from him, to not think that, okay, maybe he's not good like he says he is, but to stay with him there, to give all that suffering over to him and say, Lord, I trust you. I know you're going to bring good out of this and I'm going to stay with you here because I'm your daughter, I'm your son, and I know that you want me to trust you. So she is a perfect model of the church. She's a perfect model of faith. And one of my very one of my favorite images of uh, Mary is Our Lady of Perpetual Help. It means that she is always there for us. She's always there to um, guide us towards her son throughout scripture, um, especially at the wedding feast at Cana. She is guiding people towards her son. So the very last words we hear from Mary in scripture is at the wedding feast at Cana. She tells the servants to do whatever he tells you, do whatever Jesus tells you. And those are also her words to us now. So she never takes away from her son, Jesus. She always points us towards him again and again. So during this time, let's ask Mary in a special way, especially in this month of May, to guide us towards her son, to keep us faithful, to keep us hopeful, and to keep us joyful even in the midst of suffering. Miss you guys. I'm praying for you. Bye.